Okay, over to you, Millie. Great. Um, thanks very much. So, um, yes, this project ran last year um, and it was funded by DEFRA as part of the Treescapes program. So I'm interested in agroforestry, um, which is the land management that includes integrating trees or shrubs with agricultural systems. And you can see some examples of this here. Um, it's got lots of other terms. It's also called silvarable, silvopasture, silvopoultry, alley cropping and shelter belts. They're all different types of agroforestry, if you've heard those words before. And this has demonstrated benefits compared to non-agroforestry systems um, to biodiversity, ecosystem functions, production, profits, and climate resilience. That's the reason I'm interested in agroforestry really is the potential benefits to climate resilience, which come through improved soil health, microclimatic buffering, and um, improved biodiversity. So here's some examples of this here. This is research that's come from the University of Reading. So this is Alexa Vara's PhD, where she looked at the abundance of bumblebees in silver arable systems versus arable systems or hoverflies. And you can see an increase um, in these pollinator species. And these are some preliminary results from my PhD student, Rosie Scholes, who's looking at earthworm abundance. And you can see increases in silver arable systems in the tree row, but also spilling over into the crop alley. Um, and this is compared to the arable controls below. There's also a widespread appetite for adopting agroforestry. Um, and this is being funded through um, government and private schemes. So to put this into context, 70% of land in the UK is in agriculture and 3% of that is under um, agroforestry currently. Um, but the government have made a statutory or the previous government made a statutory commitment to increase this to 10 percent um, of arable land by 2050, which would look like an increase that's about 50 percent the size of Wales. So um, it's quite a big increase um, in Wales units. Um, however, there's still major barriers to uptake. Um, so. Research has shown that farmer knowledge is a major barrier to uptake. Um, these are the results of some ELMS tests and trials that were run a few years ago, but this has also been collaborated with other um, evidence. And there's also lots of knowledge gaps. Um, so lots of research knowledge gaps. This shows a systematic review of the impacts of silver arable cropping on biodiversity um, and each number shows a different paper looking at different aspects of silver arable management but what you can see is that there's loads of ways of managing these systems different species different alley widths different crops in the inter row and these likely um, yield different uh, ecological and production impacts um, and there's lots of knowledge gaps around how we can best manage these systems and addressing these um, both the barriers to uptake and the knowledge gaps will help us to get and keep land managers motivated by creating systems that work as well as possible, maximize environmental benefits and reduce risks, and also use public money effectively. So I did a very rapid back of the envelope calculation of the um, cost of the new schemes promoting uh, agroforestry. And depending on which options are used and um, this could be anywhere from two to 45 million to implement and three to 10 million per year to maintain um, but we're also a really interesting case study internationally for a country that's adopting agroforestry more widely so I think um, how we do it is important as an example uh, will be important as an example elsewhere so my research questions for this fellowship where what are the specific knowledge gaps that farmers perceive and what are the opportunities um, for overcoming these gaps and what are the research knowledge gaps and priorities. So starting with this education um, side, I did 27 interviews across Southern England um, and spoke to people of different genders and ages um, in different farming systems um, and also different uh, farming methods, so from conventional through to organic, uh, with varying farm sizes. And I use something called a perception matrix to look at their knowledge, um, their perceived knowledge about different um, agroforestry management methods. So this included things like um, 
how they're going to get funding for agroforestry, tree species variety and selection, tree understory management inputs through to longer term um, business, the business side of things like markets for agroforestry products, the long term financial impacts for adopting agroforestry and the legal and regulatory impacts. And then you have statements. Um, so these are opposing statements on either side. So this says um, knowledge about this is important for successfully adopting or managing infield agroforestry on my farm or on the opposite end of the scale. Knowledge about this is not important. And so the farmers go through and they rank these between one as important and five as not important. And so this farmer has said knowledge about agroforestry funding is really important for adopting agroforestry and knowledge about tree species is really unimportant. So this is a hypothetical example. Um, and then there were other statements. So this is about whether knowledge is important, whether they already know about it, whether they think advice or information is available whether they think they could trust that advice or information if it is available, finding time to access it, being able to afford it. So the reason this varies is because people may get advice from different sources. So they may look up different about different tree species online, but for legal and regulatory impacts, maybe they want to speak to a legal advisor or an agroforestry consultant. And in that case, there's a difference in the cost of it. Whether they th think they could understand the information, or whether the process of learning about it feels daunting. Um, and these statements came from preliminary discussions with farmers and also a review of the literature around um, the barriers to changing agricultural practices. And so each farmer would put a number in each of these boxes going along um, the top first and then moving down. Um, scoring each of these things. And then you can create a plot which shows how much they agree with each of these statements. So I'm not gonna go through every point individually, but just to show they, in general, they think knowledge about most of these things is important with inputs and understory management is slightly less important and that they don't know about them. So this already shows kind of what we already knew that there's lots of knowledge gaps to uptake. So they think this stuff is important and they don't know about it. But then if you look more closely, you can see differences between the types of barriers. So for agroforestry funding, they think it's important. They don't know about it. And the primary barrier to this is that they think the advice or information is not available um, and trusting it or finding time to access it would be difficult. But essentially the advice or information is not available. This will, may have changed slightly as the schemes have come out in the last year, um, but this shows, this shows, um, yeah, this shows that if the information is not there, that's the primary barrier to uptake. Whereas then for financial impacts and long-term legal and regulatory impacts, you see something really different. So this is also perceived as being important and that it's not known about. Um, but the barrier is you're getting darker colors down here. And this shows that farmers think understanding this and understanding this information um, would not be easy. And they feel daunted by considering learning about it. So what this is basically showing is that here where with agroforestry funding, it's kind of about making the information available, whereas for long term financial and legal and regulatory impacts, maybe you need something like a discussion um, because just reading the information is unlikely to help people to overcome feeling daunted about addressing these things. You need kind of a more intensive intervention there. And then as an, another, another example for tree species variety and planting arrangement, um, again, these things are important and they don't know about it um, so much, but the barriers here are slightly lower. It's not necessarily that people think this advice this information isn't available um, and that they don't trust it or that it's daunting. It's just that they feel that they don't really know about it. So this is less of a barrier to uptake and more of like a knowledge gap that you could just address by providing information. Whereas here you're seeing something that's um, stopping people from doing agroforestry. Um, and there was variation in terms of how people responded, but overall the agreement levels were high. Um, so I took these results to a 
two day workshop um, with 20 farmers on the first day where we did a training day and designed a bespoke agroforestry plan for their farms with the help of um, some agroforestry consultants at Farm Ed. And then on the second day, um, we got some more stakeholders uh, included. Um, so we had 51 stakeholders over 39 organizations and ran five breakout groups, uh, six breakout groups with five key statements each. So you can see the results um, up on the board there. And these statements included things like lack of knowledge about agroforestry funding is a major barrier to agroforestry adoption. Farmers do not think advice or information on this is available. And we brainstormed solutions to this statement specifically. And this came up with things like creating a searchable database for funding schemes um, that used a postcode search so people could identify funding options or using a suggested question list for farmers to guide the search. So for some farmers who are adopting agroforestry, they don't have any experience um, of, uh, they don't have a lot of experience of planting trees or managing trees. Um, and so it can be difficult to know what the pitfalls of different funding schemes would be. So this was saying, can um, can we create a list of key things that farmers should check for when getting um, when applying for different funding schemes? Then there was knowledge about the legal and regulatory impacts, um, and the fact that advice or information about this people are concerned about being able to understand it and finding the prospect of learning about it daunting. Um, and for this what came out really strongly was the need to have long-term experimental demonstration farms that show the long-term financial impacts. So case studies that people can see and relate to um, and that those need funding support. Um, and then also the idea of having funded independent advisors that know about forestry and farming um, and maybe some kind of agroforestry accreditation so that people can trust the knowledge that they're being given, the information that they're being given. Um, and then around tree species variety um, select and planting arrangement, um, this was more how to convey this information. And so people suggested, again, demonstration farms um, do, or just things like agroforestry workshops and conferences. Um, so not necessarily needing one to one advice um, from an agroforestry advisor, but maybe group sessions where people could learn about this together. Um, so we came up with 32 suggestions from these five statements. So these are just some examples of those. And the key findings from this are that farmers think they know little about agroforestry management with some knowledge gaps perceived as more important than others. And the perceived barriers to attaining this knowledge depends on the type of knowledge and agroforestry advice for it to be most effective. It should be tailored to the knowledge type to account for this. So the most efficient approach, if I was going to suggest one thing from these results, would be to have tailored and funded one-to-one -one advice on the business side of things. So the long-term finance, the legal and regulatory impacts, and workshops and online resources for the ecological side. So that's things like planting, species selection, and pruning. But funded long-term demonstration sites and farmer-to-farmer -farmer networks are key um, for both types of knowledge. And these can be put together to create a national education plan for UK agroforestry. So the second part was around of this fellowship was around research knowledge gaps and priorities. Um, so for that, uh, we gathered research questions from an online survey of 68 people and a workshop that was conducted by collaborators shown there at the Agroforestry Show, um, an in-person workshop. And this is just to show who responded to this survey. So um, we had researchers, policymakers, farmers, farm advisors, and NGOs. So we had a really wide range of stakeholders contributed to this. Um, these initial 250 questions were processed into 150 um, by removing duplicates and merging some questions. So what this shows is that there already was some agreement at the beginning about what which were the key research priorities. And I took these to the same workshop. Um, and on the second day, we did 
a research prioritization process using a Delphi like process, which is where you do individual voting and then you have discussion and then you do group voting. And we did two rounds of that using um, Skittles, which I don't recommend because they get very sticky. And that was the main negative feedback we had. Um, not good as counters. Um, and the way that this was split up was essentially that every table saw some version of all the questions um, through those two rounds. And depending on the level of agreement, if everyone had agreed on every question, we would have got 26 questions. And if everyone had disagreed, we would have got 78 questions. But we ended up with a top 40, which shows there was a good level of agreement within the group about what the priorities were. And uh, these have been split into different themes. Um, so in terms of human livelihoods, knowledge and perceptions, this includes questions around the nutritional benefit of agroforestry products for humans and the impact of agroforestry adoption on human well-being, including farmer workload. Then environment and production was the biggest theme with 29 questions. And this included questions around crop tree and understory selection, establishment met methods, nutrients, biodiversity, soil and ecosystem functions, yield and quality, climate resilience and carbon stocks, and also landscape scale considerations like habitat connect connectivity. And so some of those questions, examples of those questions are shown here. Um, and there's an additional one I'd like to highlight at the bottom, which is around how farmers can self-assess the benefits of agroforestry. I think this is really um, interesting that this came up. I feel like farmers are really interested in engaging with the changes that they're making themselves and being able to see how those are impacting their systems. And so I think addressing this research gap is really important um, for engaging the farming community. Then there was questions around policy financing and markets. Um, so market gaps um, for agroforestry products. This came up in the research priorities and also in the educational priorities. Um, and it comes up again and again in conversations around agroforestry in terms of people deciding what to plant. Then there's questions around income and also um, financial models and policy incentives. And then there were seven questions that went across all the themes. And this was around, again, long-term research sites came up um, this is definitely really important is having long-term demonstration sites that can um, show farmers how to do agroforestry and answer these questions. Then implications for UK food production um, and questions around net zero, renewable energy production and using agroforestry products to produce a circular system. So for example, by um, producing energy with biomass from trees produced through agroforestry. And then this last question I think is really interesting. So this was about how will large scale conversion to agroforestry in the UK impact society and land use change elsewhere? And I think it's really interesting that this came out as one of the top priorities because the stakeholders that were at the meeting were really um, UK focused stakeholders. So I think that people were thinking beyond the scale of the UK really shows a strong intention to um, have a real benefit on biodiversity and the environment and um, yeah, wider scale thinking, which I think is really important. So these results will be, are being produced, converted into a um, scheme by an artist, which I'm really excited about because it's lots of words at the moment. And um, so it's gonna become a picture. Um, and then we've applied for funding to try to answer these research questions um, and create a handbook with an evidence summary for each. So that's pending. Um, yes, and they will be published, they're in prep. So the key findings for this are that agroforestry stakeholders in the UK have a broad understanding of the potential impacts of agroforestry across scales and subjects. We identified many knowledge gaps that urgently need to be addressed to maximize the benefits of agroforestry planting and reduce the risks. But there was also high agreement about the questions to exclude. So although there are a lot of questions here, there also were a lot of questions that we decided not to include. And um, so I think these really do show the highest research priorities. Again, 
long-term transdisciplinary and multi-stakeholder research projects are needed to achieve this. So long-term projects with demonstration sites are really important. Um, and then another result I would say is that I found this multi-stakeholder workshop was a really effective way of co-producing shared research priorities, but not just creating these research priorities. Um, it's also led to many further collaborations um, and some people are now addressing some of these knowledge gaps. Um, so that's a really good outcome of the workshop. So for me, the next steps um, are to try to create a network of demonstration sites, um, particularly silver arable experiments. Um, and the aim is to co-design which interventions we would test with stakeholders to identify best management for environment production and climate resilience. Um, and I've started recruiting for this. Um, so if you know any farmers who may be interested in this, please uh, put them in touch with me. And this would be a hypothetical outcome for this long-term experiment. So it would be something like um, you have different treatments and all of those treatments are implemented on one site that's called the mother trial. And then the farmers adopt different subsets of these treatments. So this is a potential outcome of this um, trial, but it may be that everyone implements the same treatments. Um, and we are already, I've already started setting up some trials within this network. So there's a nitrogen fixing experiment um, up near Peterborough that I'm working on. Um, and this is a 25 hectare trial looking at the impact of nitrogen fixing trees in with walnut compared to non-nitrogen fixing trees. Um, and then uh, my PhD student, uh, Layla has just started and she will be looking at understory crop experiments with farmers. So planting things in the crop understory, things like rhubarb um, potentially or berries or cut flowers. Um, and that's uh, supported by DEFRA as well. So I'd just like to say thanks to DEFRA and the Future of UK Treescapes programme, to everyone who helped at the workshop um, and to FarmEd and all the participants as well. And that's it. Super, thank you. Um, fascinating. Thanks very much, Nini. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, questions. Let's have a look. Any in the chat? Ooh, not yet, no. Oops. Have I done? Um, I might start off with one then, um, just to, to kick things off. Um, I suppose it's a, it's a broader comment. That was really fascinating and interesting, and you did really well to get so many stakeholders together. I'm just wondering at your workshop, did you manage to get anybody from um, the market side, from the supply chain side of things, and what, what were their perspectives? Yeah, um, I didn't get anyone from the supply chain side, and... Um, yeah, I thought 51 people, it sounds like a lot, but then when 20 of those are farmers, suddenly the um, stakeholder seats get filled quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had to turn people away who wanted to come. <laughs> um, so we didn't, yeah, they were on my list. They were on my list of people who it would have been good to include, but they, um, yeah, we didn't include any supply chain uh, stakeholders in the end. It's nice to be in that position. We have to turn people away, though. I was surprised. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people are so interested in agroforestry. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it comes down to, really, is um, it's definitely um, having a moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, Josh, you've got a hand up. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Millie. That was really interesting. Um, I'm curious as to how the findings are then fed back into policy and I guess you know we've spoken a little bit already about that aptitude for for change and um and then also skills development there I think um yeah w w what's done in terms of uh, disseminating that across channels yeah um so we are producing policy briefs as part of the treescapes program um because this work was funded by DEFRA it's been fed back to them directly and then um I've also been, it's, I suppose my answer would be not really 
in a hugely formal way. I've sort of been sharing this with stakeholders um, through presentations at farm events, um, just one-to-one -one meetings with agroforestry advisors. Um, I think agroforestry advisors are particularly interested in the knowledge gaps um, and that has been the thing that they've picked up on most so I've spoken to people at the Forestry Commission about it who are doing a lot of agroforestry advice for farmers at the moment um, yeah and then yeah I mean I think once the results are published as well there'll be like a further push to um, disseminate them the, um, the educational priorities are going to be converted into a video summary. There'll be a video abstract as well. And um, so I think once that's done, um, I'll start to share them more widely as well. Does that answer well, your thank question? You. Yeah, yeah, it does. No, no, I agree. Um, I think it's uh, it's recognising, I guess, this value across formal, informal, non-formal, and then communicating in that way as well, isn't there, for sure. But thank you. Yeah, I think the informal communication somehow seems to be the most effective like you just don't know who's going to turn up to things when you organize events and sometimes um just one-to-one -one discussions end up being the best way to share things yeah thank you uh, Damien oh, thanks, <clears throat> thanks Millie. that was very very interesting very nice uh, piece of work actually really good um I was just interested in, I don't know if I got the figures right at the start where you were talking about the sort of targets between sort of where we're at now, which I think is 3%, and then get into this sort of 10% target. Mm -hmm. if I've got that correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I wondered in your sort of, when you were putting together the various statements and things, um, the degree to which the sort of way that that could be incentivized. So thinking about how do you get farmers to sort of adopt these practices because um you know one thing might be you know for example the sort of grants that could be available did, they, did any of that sort of come up you know what's the role of i suppose a sort of incentivization and 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 also the extent to which some of what you were talking about where that what the feeling was about how that would get us to what to towards something near that 10 percent target or is that a realistic target it's a bit of a rambling question, but sort of, do you know what I mean? Do you know where I'm coming from? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think the how it's going to be incentivized and funded was at the front of every conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because also because of the timing. So this research was done last year. So it was just before the schemes had come out. The schemes have mm -hmm. come out mostly this year. Um, uh, so there's some of some of those questions have been answered now, um, okay. but not completely. Um, but I think, yeah, so the the importance around the schemes and the funding came out really strongly in the educational priorities as the ag knowledge around agroforestry funding was rated so highly. And then okay. schemes and so the schemes and incentives also came out in the research priorities as one of the questions. So it's only represented as one question in the end, but it was submitted mm. as many questions. And okay. um, through the process, yeah. it was like an important, really important part of the discussion. Yeah. Um, your question of how we're going to meet these targets and is it realistic um, is so big because it's not just about I addressed like the knowledge barriers mm -hmm. um but there's also like the supply chain and um <laughs> like the the equipment <laughs> and yeah. just like all the logistics of it um and then communicating to people yeah I think it's it would be difficult for me to answer that question I feel like that's beyond the scope of what I know um right. I think there definitely is a lot of appetite for people to be trying new things now and agroforestry certainly is um high up that list um but then it also comes down to how you define agroforestry in terms of meeting those targets and I think there's still a little bit of ambiguity there 
Okay. Um, does That's that answer your question? No, it does. Yeah. No, I was just interested in that those figures you were presenting and and seeing where it where it sort of aligned with those. That's really great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm really just to follow up on that. Is it covered now by SFI? As, um, is it agroforestry funded as an action? Yeah, yeah. So agroforestry has its own funding now. So there's um, funding, separate funding to um, implement it. And then there's funding to manage it. Um, and um, there's like different management options under that, depending on, for example, the density that you um, plant it um, or what you plant and things like that. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've got a, um, Phil that said thanks for your presentation in the chat, and he's interested in hearing the stakeholder views that you mentioned on advisor accreditation and on the detail in knowledge barriers and gaps. He works in Deppers Farmer Countryside Program on advice and strategy, so it'd be good to catch up. Great. Yeah, um, I'd definitely be happy to talk to you more about that, Phil. Um, in terms of the, it was interesting. I found the discussion around accreditation really interesting because there was opposing views. Um, uh, more so, I think, really than the other to topics in a way, um, because there was the problem. I think the problem with an accreditation scheme for agroforestry from a researcher's perspective is that the knowledge around it is developing so quickly. Our knowledge around it is developing so quickly, particularly for silver arable systems. For silver pasture systems, there's more research on that. Um, and so it would be about finding a way to create an accreditation scheme, but also keep it really dynamic um, so that it can be updated. Um, I think people felt I think people felt it would be valuable, but um, it was hard to understand exactly how it would be implemented um, at the moment. But yeah, I think we kind of, we got into a good debate about it. And then I sort of had to move us on because we had so much to cover in the workshop. <laughs> um, but yeah, sure, I think, yeah. No, it'd be good. To, yeah, but I, I don't want to take up too much time here, but it, it be good possibly to catch up on that and you know look at ways that we could sort of address some of those barriers and that yeah. that need for flexibility but yeah be interested in in doing that at some stage definitely yeah i think it would be a good thing to um talk about further definitely mm. interesting point and i guess you have to position that and then kind of discussions about advisors having to know about so many different things at the moment as well and modules being, I think, I believe there's a module now for um, soil carbon sequestration and understanding that, for example, with BASIS, who um, provide um, CBD points to advisors. And uh, it just reflects on um, the environment they're working in and the kind of knowledge demands on the advisory community as well. Julie? Hi, Millie. Um, yeah, um, you said that you're looking for funding for to produce some guidance um, from this piece of work. Um, and I, I don't know, I might may have missed it, but I just wondered, um, would you plan to work with any farmer organisations on that piece of work? So working through sort of trusted organisations of farmers to help with dissemination of that guidance. Um, don't know what your thinking was around that. Um so the funding the piece of work that's got funding pending is um around it's not um it's not strictly guidance is what we're thinking it was more a rapid review of each of the research priorities because i think when we were creating those research priorities there were researchers there who were able to say we kind of know a bit about that already or we don't know so much about this um but I think for some of those knowledge gaps, those research priorities, we have some information, um, but we don't have a huge amount of information. So that piece of work was um, more about creating a rapid review of all those research priorities to see um, where the knowledge gaps are. And that could be 
that's that certainly would be some of those questions certainly would be useful as guidance um if we could produce it in that way so it was like less of an academic review and more of a kind of management focused review um and yeah working with farmer organizations would be really useful if we use that approach does that answer your question yeah yeah thanks Matt? Thank you, Millie. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, and I, I particularly like the way in which you kind of constructed that heat map, which was I thought was a very um, very easy way for a non-specialist to kind of understand a, a, an aggregated response. So I really enjoyed that. Could you say something a little bit more about the kind of the desire for long-term demonstration sites, which is a kind of a bit of a gold standard isn't it, of agricultural research that we need a long-term demonstration site. And, you know, the motivations for that can be varied from, you know, kicking it down the road so we'll get some results in 25 years, so let's not worry about it, to, you know, we, we really just want to see what this looks like for a couple of seasons and then we're going to give it a go. So what, what was the kind of discussion around the value of demonstration sites? Yeah. I think um, I like the way you've phrased that question. I haven't considered uh, the idea of kicking it down the road before. <laughs> um, I think uh, the value, the interesting thing about demonstration sites is that their value is different to different people, but it all comes out as the same conclusion, um, which is something that I think is, which is something I really like. So the value, um, I think the value for the farmers is being able to go somewhere where they can see what's happening, which is just totally different to reading things or seeing them in a video. You can see them. Um, and then having the evidence over long term of like the financial impacts of these systems or like in a dry year, this happened. In a wet year, this happened. Um, and being able to learn from like experiencing it in person. I think that's that's really valuable. Um, and you can also learn about trial and error. Um, we tried this thing, it didn't work, we tried that thing. Um, whereas for the researchers, you know, obviously there's a huge value to long-term experiments, which, um, yeah, because you, again, you can see how things have changed over the longer term, but it's also for an agroforestry system, we're talking about trees and they are hugely dynamic over the long term. And so their impacts at the beginning are going to be very different to their impacts um, as they mature and at the end. So having that understanding is really valuable. I think what I really like about the idea of this long term network that I'm trying to set up or other demonstration sites is actually bringing those things together where you're having researchers working there, but you're also having farmers um, learning there. And it's like a multi-stakeholder community um, where you have everybody feeding knowledge into each other. Um, I think that creates something more valuable than, for example, a farmer who is bringing farmers on to learn from what they're doing, but there's no research going on, or a research site, which is really um, a long-term research site, which is maybe um, a bit... Uh, what's the way to say this, kind of like hypothetical in the way that it's doing its management. So it's maybe it's not scalable. Um, I think having something where you can answer both questions at once is most valuable. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm resisting going down a little kind of sociology of science wormhole, but I'm guessing I'm going to steal a phrase that I don't know Damien might have used in the past that he borrowed from Funkovitz about like a post-normal situation but in a in a climate emergency with you know the climate being deeply challenged um the, the normal is missing from a long-term experiment and or a long-term yeah. demonstration so how i mean and that's not to you know this this way or discourage you from the idea of a long-term network but how do we kind of scientifically and conceptually build into long-term monitoring that we the past is no guide to the future and so what we're going to see could be you know season specific subject specific how do we how do we understand that challenge yeah 
I really like that um, question. And I think um, the answer to that is like, it's the best option. <laughs> um, yeah, I think having regular monitoring, you'll see like, certainly the system is changing, <laughs> but with regular monitoring of the same site, I think is the best way to understand that. Um, and try to account for that. Um, but certainly I agree, we're not in a static, we're not in a static situation anymore. Um, so it's important to contextualize things in that, con yeah, put things in that context. Um, and I'm always thinking about that with any results that we have now. Um, what is the, like any ecological results we have now? I'm like, what is their relevance? Their relevance isn't what the results are now. It's, um, what the results are also in the next 10, 20 years, which is going to be completely different. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was a really interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Too much for that. Damien, go ahead. Oh, no, just to follow on. Um, it's a very interesting idea, actually, I think, to have some kind of um, demonstration network like that. Um, I was just thinking, I know that the you probably know all this stuff anyway, really, but the um the permaculture group have got they've they've been trying to build demonstration um networks. They've had various modes of funding, but I know it's been it's always been a big thing that they've that they've promoted as a kind of way of of sort of um communicating what what these things actually are in terms of a kind of form of practice. Um and yeah, like a lot of the stuff that's happening in the um in some of the european research now around sort of all these kind of soil missions they're talking about yeah. lighthouses all this kind of you know i think that importance of demonstration in 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 europe is very strong and also mm. i think you could link it through to kind of um you know a, 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 both the idea that matt was talking about but also the sort of the, the kind of social learning type theory stuff as well i mean to me I really, I really do like the idea of of it at different levels, actually, both in terms of like social learning and also the kind of environmental data that you'll collect. And you know, in twenty, thirty years' time, when these practices are a lot more established, hopefully, if you've set up that type of network, then you're going to be collecting that data over time. I think, it, I think it's a really good idea, actually. Um, so anyway, just a bit of a ramble, really. Many of a couple of good EU projects, um, Agri Demo and Nefertiti, and then I think even one sort of followed those that have looked at these demonstration networks and um, the different sorts of transformative learning that goes on within them. So if you have a spare moment, you could Google those and check them out as well. Great. Thanks very much. Um, okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Okay, I think uh, no more hands up and no more in the chat, so I'll um, conclude there. But just to say thank you so much, really fascinating talk and um, prompted lots of questions. Um, Great, so stay in touch thanks for having us. me. Yeah.